Habitat for Humanity was founded and led for three decades by two remarkable people, Millard and Linda Fuller, who dared to dream big. And quoting Bill Clinton, they changed philanthropy. Not by asking people for money, but by asking people to swing a hammer. And so if you had the privilege of watching the Harvest Show some weeks back where we had Miller on, we, we promised we were going to have him back on Thanksgiving Day to tell more of his remarkable story. What is amazing is how big the dream and vision for Habitat for Humanity was and is and, and how big you carried it. But it started with daring to dream big. Yes. We actually had the first uh, meeting of... Uh, of, of a group uh, at a small Christian community near America's Georgia, a place called Cornelia Farm. And we were so poor, we didn't even have chairs. <laughs> we were seated, seated on the floor of a concrete uh, uh, slab uh, in what had been an old chicken barn. And about 25 of us were sitting around on the floor. Uh, my wife, Lynn, and I had just returned from Africa. We had been missionaries for three years over in the old Belgian Congo. Uh, today it's called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And so as we sat there on the floor, we were dreaming and praying and brainstorming about uh, this ministry that had been launched in South Georgia by building a few houses. And then we went to Africa for three years and built houses. Now we said, what, what does God want us to do with this idea? And so we said, well, we think God is calling us to spread it over the earth. And uh, we decided we would call it Habitat for Humanity. And uh, we were writing our minutes, handwritten minutes on a little yellow pad. And we actually wrote in the minutes of that meeting when we had nothing sitting on the floor of an old abandoned chicken barn. We wrote in the minutes that our first goal was to build housing for a million people. Mm. And that goal was achieved in August of 2005. In Knoxville, Tennessee, there was a big celebration of the 200,000th house and an average household five people. So sure. we had housed a million people. Mm. Unbelievable. Now you have left Habitat for Humanity and started your own project called the Fuller Center. Explain how that works. Uh, in 2005, uh, we started the Fuller Center for Housing. So we are now uh, two and a half years old. Uh, and I have never in my life seen anything grow like this new ministry. Uh, we're in 15 states. Uh, we're in seven countries. Uh, we've already had several uh, big projects uh, in my home area of East Alabama. We've launched a campaign to build 500 houses to end poverty housing in what is called the Chattahoochee Valley. Uh, we have built uh, uh, two what was called Miller and Linda Fuller builds in Shreveport, Louisiana in the northwest part of the state where we've had over a thousand people there from all over the United States and from several other countries building and renovating houses for hurricane victim families who fled after Katrina and after Rita and sure. went inland. And so that's where we came up with the phrase building on higher ground. We build on physically <laughs> and literally uh, spiritually on higher ground. And uh, we have spread all over from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa, to Benton Harbor, Michigan, to Atlanta, Georgia, and Boston, Massachusetts, all over the country starting these fuller center groups. And we are not only building new houses using pretty much the methodology of Habitat for Humanity, no profit and no interest, but we've started renovating houses and using the concept we call Greater Blessings Box. You know, the Bible says it's blessed to receive, but it's more blessed to give. And so we're particularly uh, going to older families, senior citizens who are in their late 70s, 80s, even in their 90s, who still live in their own home but they have a very low income, maybe just a social security check, mm. and the front porch is falling off, mm. and the sink has sprung a leak, and the floor of the toilet is rotted away because of a long leak. So we bring volunteers in and, and fix up whatever these problems are, maybe it's broken windows or whatever, and at the end of the process, we have a dedication, we give them a Bible, and we give them a little wooden box, which is so big by so big by so big, and we sit down at the kitchen table with the, with the family. Typically, it'll be someone in their middle 80s or whatever. And we'll say, these good-hearted people, these dedicated Christian people have come out here and renovated your house. And it's all been a gift. And the Fuller Center has put up the money, maybe four or $5,000. And it's all been a gift to you. But we want to give you the opportunity to receive the greater blessing. So... We want to know over what period of time could you pay the $5,000 back? And they say, well, I spend so much for groceries. I spend so much for medicine. I think if you gave me five years, I could do it. 
So you put 60 envelopes in the box. And say, put that on your coffee table, and every month just pull out an envelope and mail in that money. Because if you do, we'll use it to help somebody else. But if you get sick one month, you don't have to pay it because this is not a legal obligation. Right. This mm. is simply giving you the opportunity to receive what the Bible promises you, a greater blessing if mm. you pass it on to somebody else. This is an innovation that the Fuller Center is using, and we've done it in South Georgia, on the coast of Mississippi, on the coast of, uh, uh, of uh, Texas, and in Northwest Louisiana. And uh, we just think it's an exciting idea that's going to benefit many, many people over that's the years awesome. to come. That, mm -hmm. and that's awesome. And that's using the theology of the hammer. You call it the theology of the hammer. I like that. Or, uh, or Jesus economics. That's right. And, and yes, the theology of the hammer uh, acknowledges that most of religion is singing and talking. And you know, you go to church, what do you do? You're here, you're here singing and talking. Everything's verbal. And verbalization is important. I'm not diminishing that at all. But there needs to be an action component. You know, we know we are saved by the blood of Jesus on the cross. That's a free gift from God. But how do you respond to the free gift from God? It seems to me that we should have a life of giving back, mm. of, of, of how can we give back verbally and with our actions. That's part of the theology of the hammer. And another part is that we are different politically. We are different theologically. We're Protestant, we're Catholic, we're liberal, we're conservative. But why can't we agree on a tool of Jesus, which was a hammer, and use it to demonstrate God's love? You know, one of the things, you know, in the States, in the in Western culture, you've got a one, one set up. But when you go, because you've got a vision to reach out to the nations, mm -hmm. and many of those areas, they have nothing to give. What are you doing there? Well, there's no one so poor that they don't have anything to give. You know the story where that poor widow gave her little bit in the treasury, and mm -hmm. Jesus praised her? Because the poorest person can receive the blessing of giving. And so this allows them to get the, keep their dignity. Absolutely. We believe it's so important for people to maintain their dignity. I don't care how poor they are. I mean, how would you feel if somebody said to you, oh, you poor person, we know you're so poor you can't do anything for yourself, so we superior people are coming in to help you, mm. and all you have to do is pose for a picture at the end of the process. Mm. You know, you kind of are grateful for what's been done, but you feel a little diminished as a human being. But when you go to someone and say, we acknowledge your humanity. We respect the, your, your dignity. We see that you're deficient in terms of your front porch needing to be fixed or you need a new house. And we're going to work with you, not for you, but with you because you're going to work alongside us and put in your sweat equity. But at the end of the day, we want to give you the opportunity to give back, either through the Greater Blessing Box or if we built a whole house, a mortgage is put on that and you pay back at no profit and no interest. But the recipients are invited to be full participants and partners to push the process forward. And I think that's a part of the secret of why this ministry has been such a big success over the years. You mentioned going in where Hurricane Katrina had been over in Shreveport, Louisiana. Yes. And I, I'm sure a lot of people expect, oh, well, maybe they go in where there's disaster relief. How, how does the Fuller Center decide where to go and, and where to build? We go where we're invited. And... Uh, in any local area, the Fuller Center doesn't just say, okay, there's been a disaster in a certain town. Okay, we've got truckloads of people to go in there. There has to be an infrastructure, and there have to be local people who put up their hands and say, I want to form the Fuller Center in this area. That's already happened in 15 states. But uh, if, if there is a community, if a person listening to this program is in a community that does not have the Fuller Center and they would like to have one, they can contact us. We're in Americas, Georgia, easy to locate. We have a website, fullercenter.org. Uh, they can go to that website or just contact us by phone or letter or email. Uh, my personal email is mfuller at fullercenter.org. And we will respond because our door is open uh, to anybody in any country that wants to bring this ministry there to build housing or to renovate housing, we are available, we are ready, but we must have local people with whom to work. Yes. <laughs> well, we appreciate you sharing your story Thank with you. us. Go to harvest-tv.com. Check it out, the house that love built.